wanted to mention uh, our esteemed gatekeeper, Mr. Harrison, <laughs> went to try and find an extension cord. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be able to do that. Uh, so I may not be tethered quite as close to this camera, but uh, sorry, okay, Frank, I'm doing the extreme close-up mode. It, I'm sorry. Oh, is that what you're doing? Yeah, I have to you get wanna... to my keyboard, so oh. I'm going to have to uh, okay, you're doing uh, typing. pretty much mess up your angle there. Sorry. Okay. That won't help me much because I'm going to be typing. Okay, so. you know what? I can I can work with that. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to probably there. But anyway, but thank you for your support. Sure. Anyway, I really appreciate you. Uh, recording this stuff. That yeah, is that's awesome. That yeah. is. Yeah. Well, impromptu. I'll be more organized next year. <laughs> okay, so let me get set up. Keep it safe. Secret. Keep it safe in in the cloud. So, some random blather about me. I'm Pat O'Neill. As you all that don't know me, I uh, I'm a cybersecurity fellow at FedEx Services Incorporated. Um, yeah, I know cyber all things, right? Yeah. But uh, that's my uh, email, and that's my Twitter handle. Um, just in full disclosure, uh, email's probably better. <laughs> I keep up with Twitter just around these sides during the year, and the rest of the year, I really don't have enough time to do it. So um, probably your best bet is email, but I am on Twitter there, and uh, occasionally you may find me there. Um, also, while I'm talking about me, I wanted to stump for something with a, a tech group like this. One of the things that's near and dear to my heart is also the first robotics competition. Some of y'all may be aware of that. Uh, it's something that uh, I'm involved with one particular team in uh, Choctaw, Mississippi, actually. And uh, we usually compete in New Orleans. There's a new tournament in Memphis that just started this year. If you're not familiar with FRC, the first robotics competition is a high school uh, competition for high school teams. And they desperately need mentors that understand tech to help, and what could be more fun, right? To help a bunch of high school kids for six weeks out of the year build a robot to play a game, right? Everybody gets the same kit of parts. Everybody builds a robot to play the same game. And of course, they do it 100,000 different ways. And it's hilarious, and it's sometimes a whole lot of fun. So if you have any interest in, in robotics or, or high school kids or both, uh, please give it a thought. You know, FR, uh, firstinspires.org is the website. And just Google FRC, and you'll find out all kinds of stuff about it. Okay, back to the topic. Um, okay, we'll leave legalese out of the way, right? I do not speak for my company. Neither does my company speak for me. And all trademarks and logos included here are the property of their respective owners, which means basically I just stole with impunity. Okay, applied technologies for protecting secrets at scale. Um, this is just a quick. Uh, overview of what we're going to dive into today. HashiCorp Vault, uh, using modern off-in and off-in protocols like OIDC and off to, and of course TLS and JWT along with it. And, uh, welcome back, man. Um, authorization code flow in Pixie for securing interactions. It's the same off-in and off-in protocols, but on a hostile device. And it's not just mobile devices. We'll get into that too a little bit. And solving the secure introduction problem. Right. So. Let's get into it. So before we, um, to kind of spur everyone's thinking, here's a couple of philosophical <laughs> thoughts, right? The difference between a botnet herder and a cloud provider. Passflux DNS. Pro tip, it's still you paying the compute bill in both cases. <laughs> so yeah, this is what happens when you let geeks make jokes and slides, right? <laughs> anyway, for those of y'all that may not be familiar, FastFlux DNS is a type of DNS that is used by botnets, right, to kind of subvert the, the DNS system. Anyway, another of a musing. What does cloud native mean to you? My other computer is someone else's. <laughs> That's another thing to keep clearly in mind. There's a lot of things that relate um, botnet type of computing to cloud computing, and there's a, a whole lot of evolution, right? But end of the day, most, you know, in development environments these days, depending on how far along the, the evolution curve you are or the learning curve you are, you're working on someone else's computer. You don't have control at the bottom of your stack. Depending on what type of service you're consuming, you may be lower or higher in that stack, but the lowest one you definitely don't control. And it's probably uh, you know a good bet that you'd need several good lawyers to figure out who really does control it if push comes to shove. So what is HashiCorp Vault? In, in most cloud environments, we need the ability to store and keep up with secrets. But we don't have control of the bottom of the stack, right? So how do we safely secure a secret 
when we can't necessarily guarantee the you know, security of the computer that's making up the biosec. We don't have the hypervisor's control. How do we you know, even attempt to secure a secret in that kind of an environment? HashiCorp Vault is a means of trying to do just that. And the way they do that is they encrypt it before it's ever written to disk. Okay, now, mind you, that's not perfect. Certainly, it depends on your threat model, what you're trying to protect yourself from. But it's much closer than most everything else that you might try, you know, naively in the cloud. So how does it work? Shammer secret keys. Right? If you've never heard of Shammer shared secret keys, what they, they are is a way to take a secret, uh, okay, so first of all, cryptography, right? Quick little intro, you've got asymmetric and symmetric cryptography. Symmetric cryptography is when you have a secret key and everything is encrypted with that secret key and you've got to protect it by golly. Asymmetric keys is what you see in like TLS. You know, you use it in your browser and the web all the time, right? You have a public and a private key that are related to each other, they're a key pair. The public half of that key can encrypt stuff that the private key can decrypt. The private half of that can encrypt stuff that the public key can decrypt. That's the basis of things like Diffie-Hellman and all that key reading stuff that your browser uses to encrypt all your banking traffic and whatnot. Those things um, allow you to do encryption between parties where you have, don't necessarily have an a priori relationship. But with a shammer shared secret key, you take that in symmetric key and you break it into parts. So think like the nuclear launch codes, right? We don't want one guy being able to control the nuclear launch codes. And uh, that is not a political statement, by the way. You want multiple people to be involved to turn that key, right? Well, that's exactly what a shammer shared secret key is. You take a key and you break it into five parts and then you say, okay, you need at least three of the five to be able to do something. And that's a very, very useful uh, thing. And in the case of HashiCorp Vault, what you do with it is you unseal the vault. So basically what a vault is, it's an encryption abstraction that sits on top of some storage layer. Okay? So if you have secrets, you interact with the vault just like you would any other web service. Once it's unsealed, you give it the secret that encrypts it and writes it to some storage layer. Right? Before it ever writes it to that storage layer, it's encrypted. And it's encrypted with a master key that's unlocked by this unsealing operation that requires collusion between some number of people. Okay, so that's a quick intro, but let's talk about some of the details here right quick. That second line there is a, bit, a little bit of gobbledygook. It's kind of Linux specific. And that's okay to be, you know, Linux is popular nowadays. We, we aren't just the, those geeky people that live over there anymore, right? <laughs> it's running most of the cloud, so it's, we actually have to pay attention to Linux these days. Set cap is a way to set a capability. What that capability sets on the vault binary, so this is the, the oh wow, that, that doesn't work so well. The vault binary, right, you're setting the capability to IPC lock. What that means is you can lock memory, okay? It turns out that's a crucially important thing to do when your whole security model rests on being able to protect memory from what else is in your multi-tenant environment. And you only need to do that for a short period of time, a window of time in which you encrypt the data before writing it to the storage layer. Right? So again, not a perfect. There's no real perfects in security, right? But a whole lot better than most of the other things that we got available prior to the introduction of multi-tenant environments. So how many of y'all know what S3 is? Okay, cool. How many of you know what um, console is? Ever heard of console? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those terms. Console is another HashiCorp. HashiCorp is a company that makes ball. It's all the stuff they make is open source. Right? And you can use the open source version, which is what I mean by OSS there is the open source version of Vault. You can use S3 and OSS in deploy Vault in an open source mode where you don't have to pay anything to you. And I don't want to argue why you would want to do that, versus paying for their commercial product for both Vault and console. Now Vault is a web service. You gotta interact with it. You have to have a token to interact with that web service, a Vault token. You want to keep up with your data once it's encrypted. It's encrypted before it's stored. But you have to worry about, well, what's the uh, 
you know, availability of my storage layer. Right? Console is a elastic storage layer, you know, among other things, it's also a DNS provider. But console will allow you to plug in to Vault. And when you do that, it's the storage layer underneath you, but it resides in memory too. So you then have to work harder to solve the problem of where do I back this stuff up in a resilient manner. Okay. Now, commercial Vault uses a model where when you're interacting with Hashcore Vault, you have a cluster. And the, the master of that cluster is elected among the Vault members. And again, this is just the commercial product. When you set it up that way, all the traffic into that cluster is going through that one Vault instance. Now, from, from my rather jaundiced perspective, that's what I call a scalability problem. You don't necessarily want all the traffic going through there, because then to scale that up, you have to scale that one node. Right? That's a problem. Right? It's not necessarily an intractable one, but it's a significant problem. A more significant problem is consoles memory based. If you have to wait on a backup operation to complete before you got a safe record of your data, well, now you're talking about something you might lose data. Now, HashiCorp probably wouldn't necessarily agree with my estimation of this, but I'm talking about, um, you know, my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I think it's worth something. <laughs> S3 and OSS version of Vault, you can actually configure S3 underneath Vault as a storage layer. It's not their typical supported one. It's one, you know, they support many different storage layers because people have developed plugins for Vault and somebody developed an S3 plugin. Now, let's talk about S3 for a moment. Amazon provides a storage service, S3, secure, uh, scalable storage service, if I remember the acronym correctly. And of course, it's been in the security news many, many times because people mis misconfigure their S3 buckets, you know, and then, you know, everybody's been in news over that one. Well, S3 is also a protocol definition. There are many different implementations of that scalable storage service. Uh, Minaya, MC, you know, these different, um, there are op several open source versions of it and several commercial ones like SwiftStack and what have you. There are lots of different people that have implemented software where you can run your own service or you can purchase your own service from somebody in the cloud providing that, not just Amazon. I'm sure those of y'all that have played around with Azure and GCP have seen their offerings in that same space. Since Amazon kind of set the, um, the bar, right, they kind of, you get to define the de facto standard when you're first out the gate, right? And so Amazon has done quite a bit of that, right? So now everybody else is saying, okay, we'll offer it the same way you did, right? And that's a good thing. Standards are, you know, often helpful. When you deploy HashiCorp Vault on top of S3 and use S3 to replicate your data, you can actually deploy a cluster where every write doesn't have to go through the master. You just tell it to be a true cluster where you can, like, say you have three, three nodes, right? Any of the three can respond because they're all sharing the same key definition after unsealing. And they're all writing to a shared storage layer in S3. So that's um, something that uh, you may want to play around with if you have to deploy this at scale. Um, you definitely don't want to you know, have a, a stovepipe for all your I.O. if you're talking about you know, ramping this up the highly. I don't know how many of y'all work in environments where you're deploying stuff uh, at high volume rates, but it's, it's a big deal if you are. So food for thought. Now, one of the problems you have when using Vault to store secrets is what we call the secure introduction problem. Okay, how many of y'all have ever used a, a, an encrypted file or a key store? You know, in some program? Yeah, mostly, okay. The, you get into a problem that's kind of like a rabbit hole when you're talking about um, encryption. Okay, so let's take Java key stores for example. You know, I use those all the time. A Java key store has a passphrase that unlocks it. It stores a key that you may use to encrypt or unlock other data. But where do you keep the passphrase that unlocks the key store? Well, we'll, we'll encrypt it. We'll encrypt it with a key, right? Well, where are you going to keep the key? Uh, well, a key store. <laughs> well, okay. Put in another key store. Well, you got to uh, unlock that. How are you going to unlock that with a passphrase? <laughs> yeah, you get the idea, right? That 
phenomenon occurs all the time in computing, especially when you're trying to use cryptography. And you know, it's, it's an endless rabbit hole. There's turbos all the way down. I mean, it's a problem. That's what I mean when I talk about the secure deduction problem, but in a slightly different way. You have to have a token to talk to the vault. So somebody had to give you that token. And somebody had to give you that token in a secure manner. Right? Because if they didn't, it could get leaked. So how do we do that? So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to try, probably unsuccessfully, to uh, swap away from my slides here. I'm showing all some stuff. Um, let's see, let me do it in the, the window that's actually, y'all can, everybody can double check uh, they can see that? Yeah. Good? Okay. All right, so what we just did is we basically kicked off a Vault server running locally on my laptop. And it's not doing anything fancy like sitting on top of S3. It's just sitting on the local disk, you know, and all that. But I also said, hey, unseal it. Right? What I did was I automatically unsealed it. So now, if we look at what we have listening, um, just ignore the 33461, 53, you all know what it is, but the 8200 and 8201, that's all. Right? It's now listening. If I do a vault command, like vault status, it tells me on some gobbledygook because I forgot to do this. Got to set your environment variables. All right. Now, when you interact with vault, there's two environment variables that you need to set. The vault address, it's kind of important, right? and that's what I forgot to set here, and your vault token. You don't necessarily have to pass it through the environment, but you've got to pass it somewhere. And you have to have a vault token that's valid. When we just fired off that vault server, what we also did was we did three of these things inside of a shell script. Vault operator unseal. Right? If you do that command, it'll tell you you didn't type it right because I forgot to put it in. But that command actually is how you tell it, hey, I have one of those shards of the Shammer secret key that was generated when I initialized the vault, and I want to unlock it. And I actually had to do that operation three times in my script. That's why you saw it scroll so far. Right? Every one of those unlocked one-third of the seal. And only after all three of those were done could we actually then do something like, say, list a bunch of policies. Now, Vault has two concepts that are fundamental to using it, a policy and the actual data in a path. It, it's almost, uh, it's hierarchical, just like directories on a file system. But you actually specify a policy that says, there's, there's a token associated with this policy, and this token, by policy, can operate, read, crud, you know, whatever, on this particular data. So you don't have to necessarily have a vault for each application. Right? You can have one instance of a vault service and service all your needs for everybody that's in your cloud environment so that you can actually store secrets across a wide range of applications. In fact, you can, might have several thousand of them, like some, somebody who shall remain endless. Okay, getting back to... Here. I guess I killed it. No. So much for that. Let's see if I can get back to it. Oh, yeah, okay. Now, what kind of secrets do you need to store? Everybody is probably, if you're, if you're doing cloud data development, you're interacting with microservices, you're interacting with somebody else's API, you're doing all kinds of things all day that involve these protocols, right? TLS, obviously, is a given. You gotta have security, you know, you gotta have an encrypted channel when you're interacting with an API. What is a JOT? What is OAuth2? What is OpenID Connect? Well, OAuth2 and OpenID Connect are modern authentication and authorization protocols. OAuth2 predates OpenID Connect, and it's an authorization protocol. How many of y'all have ever gone to a website that said, log in with Facebook, or log in with Google? Seen that? Everybody seen that? Somewhere? Right. That's an example of OpenID Connect. It grew out 
of things like Yelp and other applications where you had a, a need for somebody who is maybe a Facebook user, maybe a, a Google user, some kind of you know, person using the web, and they want to say, hey, this third-party application like Yelp, I want to give it limited access to my credentials in another environment, like a Facebook, like a Google, or what have you. <coughs> OAuth 2 was designed to provide that need. And it did that with a three-legged flow of protocol, if you will, that allows you to interact and say, I delegate certain permissions to this actual third party. Well, that wasn't quite far enough, um, because OAuth 2, as a spec, left a lot up to the implementer when it came to doing things that went beyond just that kind of authorization. Sometimes you're not really interested in just authorization. Sometimes you're interested in, hey, I want to know, is this Mr. Harrison or is it Mr. Sistra? Right? I need to know identifying attributes. And that's how OIDC was formed. It tightened up the spec and added the notion of something called a JWT, which is used for an ID token. Now, in OAuth 2, let me see, how many of you getting ahead of myself here? Well, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. In OAuth 2, when you interact with a system, you're going to get a token. And that's called an access token. And there's two other types of tokens that are involved in OIDC and OAuth 2 that you may have to interact with. One is called a refresh token, and one's called an ID token. That ID token is where JOTs come, come in. You can use JOTs for the other types of tokens as well, but it's primarily been seen in the ID token. Now, when I interact with an authorization service with OAuth 2, if I'm implementing a web app and I want to let somebody log in with their Google creds or log in with their Facebook creds, I can be a delegated third party to either of those ecosystems. But to do that, I have to register with those ecosystems. I have to get a client ID and a client secret that represents my app. Right? So when you do that, you kind of store that somewhere secretly. So let's assume that you're the next Lyft or the next Uber, right? And you're interacting with other systems all over the web to actually provide the business value that your particular application niche provides. You're going to need to be able to store client IDs and client secrets for lots of different APIs that you may interact with. But you're also running in AWS, or you're running in Azure, or you're running in Google Cloud, or Rackspace, or a ton of others. Um, well, how do you do that securely? Well, this is one way you can do that. You can do that with Kubernetes. Now, you may also be running in an environment where you're blended, where you have cloud, uh, cloud on-prem, so to speak, and a cloud partially in the cloud, where you can actually flex back and forth. A lot of people are doing that these days for two reasons. One reason is so that they can augment their capacity but not necessarily have to pay cloud costs all the time. Another reason is when they want to actually operate across multiple providers. Well, how do you do that, right? That's where something that we'll talk about in a few minutes comes in, and that's Kubernetes and PCF. But before we get into that, let's talk about OIDC a little bit more in the flows. What I was just describing a moment ago, where you have, you're interacting with, you know, like log in with Google or log in with Facebook, and then you interact with an application. That's using authorization code flow. There's really three flows that you care about using. In the spec, there are more flows, but you really don't want to use them. The ones that you really don't want to use are password flow. Just don't do it. If you're American Express, everybody laughs at you on the internet for doing that. If you never use the implicit flow, if you can avoid it. This is a recent change. The implicit flow used to be the only way to handle things like native mobile apps or single page JavaScript web applications, which today, almost everybody's doing one or the other or both. The reason that implicit flow is a problem is because it makes an assumption that's just not true. You cannot store a secret safely in a native mobile app. Now, a lot of people might believe different, but it's just not true, right? Because remember, it's, the attack surface isn't just your mobile device which frankly, there's plenty of ways you could subvert it on your mobile device, either ecosystem. But even if it's not attacked on your mobile device, you still have to worry about the app store. So um, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. There's probably several other people in the audience that can speak volumes on that. But 
Suffice it to say that you cannot guarantee the safety of a secret that you store on your mobile device. Well, what do you do? Yeah, don't put it on the mobile device. Great, okay. I'm listening. What about the rabbit hole you were talking about earlier, right? That's where authorization code flow and authorization code flow with Pixie comes in. You also cannot safely store a secret in a JavaScript application running in someone's browser. The jury's still out. I'm personally of the opinion that it's just impossible, but there are some people that still think you can store a secret securely in server-side JavaScript. Right? And I guess it depends on where your server side is and what lengths you go to to secure that. But if you're running in a browser or if you're running on a client side, if you're running in a thick desktop, oh yeah, y'all keep me honest. I see some, we're halfway there. Okay. Um, you can't store a secret safely in JavaScript in a browser, guaranteed. You can't store secrets safely in most client side environments, including Windows, Mac OS, what have you. Even if you store it from the browser, right? You can, you might have a false sense of security about it. But believe you me, lots of people have been burned. Right? So <coughs> authorization code flow presumes that your client is none of those things. It assumes that you're running a client application on a server side environment, either in your own cloud or someone else's. So if you can do that, then you can safely assume that you've got a safe place to store your client secret, like HashiCorp Vault. But if you're not running there, how do you extend the trust that you have on the server side? And that's where this slogan, now what, what this little eye chart here is, is basically walking through authorization code flow. So let, let me just mention that right quick. As a user, I'm using a browser, maybe a, a native mobile app, it doesn't matter which one, and I want to use a third party app. It might be the new cool Uber or something like that. Whatever it might be, I say, hey, yeah, I'd like to use your app. So download it from the App Store, or load it in my browser. <coughs> well, it says, okay, I don't know who you are, so go to the auth server, the Facebook, the Google, whatever it might be. It might be your own authorization server. You log into that authorization server, <coughs> And it says, hey, okay, here's a temporary code. That's why it's called authorization code flow, because you're getting that code from the authorization server. Then you say, okay, I've got my temp code. I go back to the app, say, hey, here's a temporary code. Give me a code. It goes to the authorization server and says, here is the code, the authorization code, and oh, by the way, here's my client ID in secret. Then the authorization server, the Google or the Facebook, says, okay, I believe you. Here's your, here's your token. Then the actual app can interact with what it was trying to interact with <coughs> to begin with. That delegated that authentication and authorization to that authorization server or service. And then you get your data and you return the result. Simple enough, right? As long as you've got a place to store securely the client secret. But if you don't, this is what you can do. <coughs> the browser or native mobile app or whatever it might be the user's interacting with goes to that app and says, hey, I'd like to use you. The app says, okay, I'm going to generate a secret. I'm an untrustable app. I know I can't store a secret, but I can make one up. So I make one up randomly. And then I give it back to that actual user. <coughs> and when I do that, I also hash it. And what I give back to them is just the hash of the secret. I don't actually give them the secret itself. So the user interacts with it, they get that hash back. They then go through the same steps with the auth server, they log in and say, here's my, uh, my hash. And the authorization server says, okay, well here's the temporary code. Well, when it tries to use that token, the app says, okay, here's the code that you gave to my user, and here's the plain text that I just made up. And hopefully I made it up in a cryptographically secure manner, but that's another topic. So once the authorization server gets the plain text, it can then generate the hash and compare it to the hash that it actually got, and if it verifies, then it returns the access token. Now why is that useful? It's because then that app never actually had to store anything secret, because if you actually subvert and grab the hash, it doesn't matter. You still don't know what the original plain text was if you're not that app. So we can trust this because this is running in somebody's cloud or server-side environment. So it, we can believe that it can store that plain text securely for some period of time. But we don't trust this. 
because it's a native mobile app, because it's a single page Java web, you know, JavaScript application, what have you. But we still get the results, we still got a token, and we were still able to make a secure call. That's Pixie, and that's what you should always use nowadays instead of implicit flow. And uh, the only other flow of any note that you'll probably use involves machine to machine calls. So if you're making a machine to machine call, like an app to app call, you're already on the server side. You can use a direct client ID in secret and get a token directly for it. That's called the client credentials grant. And you can use that one safely in your cloud or someone else's as long as you can store your client secret securely. Uh, in fact, I think that's what I just said in that slide. Anyway, now, cloud native. We mentioned that term uh, earlier. Pivotal Cloud Foundry is a cloud native computing environment that you can roll on your own hardware. It's open source. You can roll it inside of any cloud provider's environment. Right? It basically provides a containerized environment for you to run cloud native applications. It's probably the easiest thing to run in there is Spring applications or Go applications, but there's, it has support for a wide variety of different types of applications. They're also the people that are behind Spring, so it, you know, very common, they uh, probably the best supported environment for supporting. So what is Kubernetes? How many of y'all have heard of, of either of these? <clears throat> so good many of you Kubernetes probably doesn't need any introduction. It's, um, it's been kind of taking market share from every other platform as a service, if you will, and I use that term a little bit loosely. But um, Kubernetes is the one that came out of Google and it's now been donated to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And Kubernetes and PCF are both environments where you take some code that is your app, and you remember that little diagram we're looking at, it's that, that block that is running in the cloud. Right? You can run it in you know, a managed Kubernetes environment or a managed PCF environment or your own Kubernetes environment or what have you. Well, <coughs> excuse me, each of those environments um, have certain attributes about them, and we've touched on them several times in some of the other talks today. So let's talk about it right quick, because it's an important thing uh, if you're trying to do cloud native development. How many of y'all have heard the term cattle versus pets? Okay, this is part of the culture shock that we're trying to get development on for cloud native computing. Right? If we want security in the cloud, we can't do things the way we've done before. Uh, it's just like you know, some of the examples that Chris mentioned in, in the ICS world. Right? So many of the problems related to ICS are related to I didn't fund updates to the infrastructure I'm using constantly. And it's not just ICS, I mean, it's all over the place. If you have a lot of on-prem infrastructure, even including, um, <laughs> there's a comment that I saw the other day on, on Twitter from, uh, there's a, a Twitter account called Swift on Security um, that is just hilarious if y'all haven't ever. Well, one of the comments I made the other day was, let's see if I can remember exactly how that went. Um, if you allow email into your network, then every computer is internet facing. And you know, that, that's priceless, and it's so true. So when you think about that, a lot of the infrastructure that we're not necessarily funding updates to isn't just the ICS, it's the desktops. It's the stuff that's right out there in your offices. Um, so cattle versus pets is about changing that mindset. We used to deploy servers in a production environment, and we worked all kinds of hours trying to keep them patched, and we'd end up with not patch anyway. Right. So, Cattle means we don't attach so much em emotional significance to our servers. Right? I don't care about them that much anymore. I want to shoot them in the head every 15 minutes and redeploy them from something called infrastructure as code. Why would I do that? Because if I can standardize the image I'm using and build out a new image of that server every 15 minutes, guess what I've just done? I've shortened the time of opportunity for a kill chain to complete. So let's let's roll that back a little bit. Right? There's a, a term you'll see in, in the security community uh, called rotate, repair, and repave. The three R's, right? 
then sometimes they're expressed in a few other ways too. But the idea is simply this. If you can reconstitute your server infrastructure at whatever granularity your business can support, right? If it's 15 minutes, great. You know, make your <coughs> DOD, you can actually probably pull that off. But convincing your developers is usually the hard sticking point there. But that means somebody who has a zero day in their hand. They can still exploit you, sure. You know, it hasn't been patched yet. But they've got 15 minutes to do it now as opposed to an indefinite amount of time. Not the forever day case that you mentioned earlier. So I mean, think about that for a minute. That's one of the most compelling arguments that we have for using the cloud, at least from a security perspective, and that's come along in decades, right? Many people think that there's no way that doing anything in the cloud could possibly be secure. But when you think about it, we might be able to use a cloud environment orders of magnitude more securely if we can just figure out how we can trust somebody to store secrets. Well, that's where HashiCorp Vault comes in. So and I'm not saying you have to use HashiCorp Vault. There's probably other ways you could do it. You know, you could roll your own, right? But they've done a lot of good work, and I've audited some of their code base. It's pretty clean. It's good stuff. So when you're talking about cloud native computing, when you're talking about securing a cloud environment, these are the kinds of conversations you need to be having with your development teams. The conversations about how do we actually get to where we can deploy in a managed manner. Um, Frank had all kinds of things to say about exactly this point this morning, you know, with CI CD. If you can actually get to the point where you're using infrastructure as code to stamp out the server infrastructure, that greases the, the wheels to handle CI CD on top of that. And it also reduces the testing burden because you can take an image that you're actually using to bundle your application onto and test it independently with fuzzers, with all kinds of other things, to actually get an idea of what the security posture looks like before you add the application into the mix. And then you add all the testing stuff that you were alluding to this morning, and you get some really powerful stuff. Now, what are the trust routes that we've got? Right? These are the things that let you have a chance of doing it more securely in a cloud than you do on them today. Infrastructure is code, trusted provisioner, and instance identity. Okay, so let's talk about each of those right quick. We've, I've been you know, rat rattling off this term, infrastructure is code. What does that really mean? Infrastructure is code is when you use something like Bosch, Terraform, Puppet, Chef, Ansible. There, there are different technologies out there that do this kind of thing, but the, the fundamental idea is you have a file, like a YAML file, that defines what your infrastructure looks like. Sometimes it's the networking and the servers. You know, it, it varies by you know the, which product you're using. But that gives you a way to deploy into a VPC in your cloud environment exactly the infrastructure defined by that file. Then that infrastructure file becomes a piece of code. You manage it in Git or GitHub, GitLab, whatever you use, just like you would code, and then you delta it accordingly. The presumption is that when you make a change to that file, you can make the corresponding change to the production environment by <coughs> applying that. Right? Now, this, the second trust we've got here mentioned is a trusted provisioner. When I use that term, I'm talking about something like Kubernetes, or I'm talking about something like PCF. You have something that plays the role of spinning up your application in a cloud environment. It also plays the role of saying, hey, I want this many instances running, and if one dies, I want you to restart it. The, the way you express that differs depending on what technology you're using, but the the provisioner has a really trusted place in your infrastructure in a cloud environment because it's the one thing that can say, hey, I'm stamping out instance 27 of this image. I'm going to mark it with some trustable watermark of some sort. That's how you get down to instance identity. So let's assume that you have uh, an elastic environment where you spin up multiple instances of your application to, to meet a surge of volume. Maybe you have a regular three instances running all the time, and then you spin up to maybe 10, depending on how, how your volume surges, right? Each instance can be pre-configured by the provisioner to have a unique identity. 
usually there's a unique identity built into the platform with its PCF or its Kubernetes. Right? And you can leverage that to solve the secure introduction problem we mentioned earlier. So let's, let's see. The open service broker, actually I won't go to that one yet. I think I was supposed to have a demo here, so I'm gonna try and just kill that. Okay. Um, I'm running a Kubernetes environment locally on my laptop, and I'm gonna deploy a little YAML file just to give you some idea of what I'm babbling about. And now let me make this window a little bigger because I know my eyesight's awful. I'm sure y'all's is probably better than mine, but just in case. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Okay, so what we just did is we deploy, deployed a small application using YAML to our little mini cube environment. Now, for those of y'all that, that are, you know, know about Kubernetes, what I'm running here is just a little virtual box instance of mini cube. So it's not exactly a large scale cloud. It's kind of four gig. You know, so, hey. But, you know, hey, you use what you have, right? I think Chris said that eloquently earlier. Right? So, Kubernetes is running inside that little 4 gig virtual box VM of mine, and I just deployed an application to it. Now, why that is interesting is because guess what we just did? We used infrastructure as code. That's exactly what we're talking about. What we did is we took an application image, defined what its opening port was and all the different things that we put into a typical manifest for Kubernetes, and we deployed that. Now, if I put that into my source repository, I can change that out to that over time and modify it. I can modify things that are a little bit more complicated, like the replicas. I might want more. You can also, this is a very, very simplistic example of a YAML file for Kubernetes. You can get very sophisticated with this stuff, and in fact, if you get sophisticated enough, you don't even use this particular type of YAML. You use another YAML file called a Helm chart. But the point is, that you're actually controlling what is stamped out in your environment through another process that is orchestrated by a computer <coughs> orchestrator. That is how you can wire trust into your instances. And then you can have the, uh, what was the term we used? Uh, freedom, I suppose. Um, to have the, oh, it was confidence, yes. Have the confidence to actually allow that to shoot them all in the head every 15 minutes and just reconstitute them for the sake of no other reason than to shorten the, the kill chain lifespan. That's how things can, that's the really, in fact, that when you think about it over the last 10, 15 years or so, that's the only defense mechanism I'm aware of uh, outside of things like WAFs and firewalls, but that can actually defend against a zero day. A firewall can't really defend against a zero-day unless it happens to block the, the traffic. A WAF can't defend against a zero-day unless it knows about it. The key, the key thing about this particular approach is it will defend against things it has zero knowledge about. It doesn't know the first thing that it's trying to be subverted, but just because we killed it soon enough, it still couldn't be subverted. I have no idea what the average lifespan of a kill chain is most of the ones that I have personally interacted with have been way longer than 15 minutes. Um, I'm sure there's some that are quicker than that. Uh, keynote by uh, the CTO of, of um, Dimitri, hang on, uh, CrowdStrike, uh, was that it depends on the adversary. Mm -hmm. Most in their data that can be very long, like several hours. The Russians in particular are about 18 minutes when they mm. pivot and do what they do. Yeah, so, so. some some of our answers may make sense to shorten it for 50 minutes and even, even less. Right? Um, but that's going to be a function of what your business will tolerate as well. But, um, but yeah, I mean, think about it from the perspective of changing the threat model. I'm not saying that it's perfect, because there's always the hypervisor, right? There's always the cloud environment itself. We saw that uh, not too long ago. I can't remember the name of that lady that uh, 
was an ex-employee of Amazon that managed to uh, yeah, make a lot of trouble with S3, surprisingly. But yeah, so getting back to, let me see if I can restart my slides. Again. Okay, so the last thing I was going to mention was the open service broker API. So the secure introduction problem, right? We need a way to get that token. So I'm going to illustrate that for you in PCF terms, because I've done more of that than, than Kubernetes. In Cloud Foundry, you have a notion of something called a service broker. And they could actually created an open version of that under the Cloud Native Computer Foundation. And the, the idea is that you can bind to a service because you're running in the platform. So you have an app. You've deployed it into PCF. You've used your CICF. CI CD pipeline to do so, maybe it's Jenkins, maybe it's Concourse, whatever it might be. Once it's deployed, part of the actions that your pipeline can say is, hey, I want to bind to this service, and this service is then going to say, hey, you're instance 27. I know who you are because I just talked to the trusted provisioner, and they said that you are a legitimate instance. So by the way, here's your vault token, and I stuff it into the environment of that running process, that container. So that's one way to solve the secure introduction problem. If you run rootless containers, and if you turn off things like secure cell access to your containers and do all the things that you should do in, in a cloud computing environment, especially in a multi-tenant environment, then you've just gotten a way to get a hold of that vault token probably as securely as you can, and actually then be able to interact and get at all the other secrets that you might need to that may be much more long-lived than that token. So that's pretty much what I got. Questions? I have uh, put some remarks. Um, you mentioned having the 15 minute interval as a good mitigation for um, uh, persistent vulnerabilities. Um, on that topic, serverless computing would be another similar uh, mm -hmm. medium to go about doing that. Yeah, it absolutely applies. In fact, um, you can do serverless with Project Griff on top of PCF. Mm -hmm. I think there's a similar <coughs> plumbing on top of Kubernetes if you want to run it on, on your own premises. But doing serverless like in Lambda functions in AWS, mm -hmm. most of the big providers that are doing serverless have an analog to Vault already wired in, available, that you can purchase if you don't want to roll your own. Mm -hmm. Now that's an interesting question. You might want to roll your own and not use theirs <coughs> for the sake of who do you trust with your data. It just depends on the type of business you're in and what kind of, you know, if you if you can root your trust in keys that you control and the provider doesn't, that may be a stronger posture than what they're providing in their KMS analog or HSM analog. Right? But yeah. Uh, another comments are fine too. I uh, I think I think it'd be a good idea to roll your own because um, I'm not a fan of homogenous uh, secret store solutions. I'm not a fan of things like LastPass where everybody does oh, yeah. exactly the same thing the exact same way and we're all <laughs> waiting for some virus to go poof and we all lose all of our passwords at once. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, um, most of my family are quite tired of hearing me get on my soapbox about that. Uh, I've looked at um, a thing called KeePass, mm -hmm. KeePassX, and many KeePass. Mm -hmm. So you can use the same database type on all your devices and share it, and it's locally on your device, uh -huh. and it's encrypted with your password. Right? I much vastly prefer that to LastPass or these others that involve some server-side environment. Right? Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily as strong as Vault, where you've got multiple shared keys, but it's probably a lot more usable when you're talking about your just local day-to-day -day passwords. Um, also, something to think about. If you're trying to control a vault instance as much as you possibly can, you, you want to really harden the set of machines that you run your vault service on. You don't necessarily have to run those in the cloud. You just need to be able to reach them over the network. You can run them on-prem if you have a very uh, secure way to run things on-prem or secure in the cloud. That isn't always true. You can also run them in something that's called a, a bare metal as a service cloud environment. Packet, if you've never heard of them, right? They actually allocate you a single <coughs> machine that you get full control of when you rent space from them, right? 
right? So it's like throwback to the old model, but for the sake of the fact that you don't have to worry about multi-tenant uh, you know, noise on your particular machines for something that's very highly secure. Then you build a root of trust on top of that, and you've got something that you can necessarily control a lot more, and then you don't necessarily have to trust you know, the Amazon or the Google or where you may have the rest of your application fabric deployed. So good for that. But yeah, good, good question. Is this HashiCore the same one that makes uh, Vagrant? Yep, same ones. Mm -hmm. Console, Vagrant. Yeah. Another thing to throw out there, more of a remark about the, you know, the cows for, or cows Please. versus pets. Uh, oh, yeah. I think it was Netflix, they had a, a thing they called Chaos Monkey that yes, would go did. around and smack down servers in their network. And it was less for security reasons than to find out when they had code right. that didn't handle that stuff very well. <laughs> oh yeah, so, I mean, that, use that's what uh, that's kind of like the, uh, the the cream of confidence, right? When you really are confident in your environment, then you can set loose a chaos yeah. monkey and, and you know, there's, rule there's, rule by, by the way, yeah. Netflix yeah. is like one of the examples of a company that's been built from the very first day of their existence on test-driven development. Yeah. And, and so, cloud-native development. Yes. In fact, that that's really a key point. Netflix didn't start from where most of us in the Fortune 500 started. <laughs> because most of us in the Fortune 500 are still dealing with baggage from way, way back. And, you know, the, those that have been impacted by not patching, which my employer certainly was greatly impacted by not patching. In fact, I remember running into Chris at the airport and all that went down. Um, you don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to just turn all that stuff off and start from a clean slate. If you did, oh man, well we could all be uh, doing a lot better and emulating things like Netflix has done and many others. So I'm, I'm sure Uber and Lyft, a lot of these uh, Airbnb, all these new startups, there's a real tactical advantage nowadays to starting from a fresh slate. But, you know, it is what it is, you know, you kind of have to do what you can with what you have available, as somebody might have said earlier today. Mm -hmm. I want to point out that the, I mean, in your case, you're using a, he's using a YAML configuration for K8 Kubernetes. But intellectually, that's the same thing I showed at the end of my talk when I pulled up the Circle CI config. Mm -hmm. That was saying, hey, give me a, a web server that's running this version of Linux. If it was more complicated, give me a database server that's running this version of PostgreSQL. Give me another Linux server that's running this version of, of Elasticsearch or whatever. And then boom, when that, that package gets loaded up by CI, you could run CI in K8, whatever the tool is. Boom. Magically, it may not run. It may run at an emulated speed from your, your production network, but it runs. And it is computationally the same as your production. And so that test environment is very... Um, high fidelity to production, mm -hmm. and that's a huge game changer. I uh, I was really tickled at, during your talk when you were talking about running some of your CI/CD pipeline and some of those tests on ephemeral Docker containers. Um, that seems so obvious in retrospect. Why isn't everybody understanding that? Right? I have that conversation on the daily with people, trying to get them to understand that we shouldn't treat our CI CD pipeline infrastructure or our testing infrastructure as pets. You can make the same mistake in other ways, even with new development, even with new plumbing, if you still don't say, hey, how can we make things ephemeral? And you know, that, that notion of infrastructure on demand driven by code is an exceedingly powerful one. But getting people to understand it, especially if they're they're new to cloud native computing. It's, it's difficult. It is absolutely, you know, you hear people say it's a culture shock. It is. It really is. And people have to kind of adjust their thinking in steps along the way. Let me add. So we have, let's say, our cloud environment, you know, cloud computing can be expensive. But as a company, what have I given every one of my developers? Every one of them has a $3,000 laptop with 32 gigs of RAM in the latest, greatest, amazing <laughs> hardware. That thing can spin up these Docker images actually faster than our cloud environment can. And so they can use it for local testing. And then when they say it's ready, the cloud environment is the ultimate grader. 
because they can't right. bypass it. So it still runs, but we allow them with this sort of configuration. You can you you can de you can dev with the same st staging infrastructure that is a mirror of real life, mm -hmm. and that is huge. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And this is another reason. I'm sorry. Get off my heart. Open source is huge. No one wants to deal with this if you have a million freaking dollar license that you have to pay for something critical infrastructure. <laughs> um, and right. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say it that way. But oh, I think no, a lot sorry. of the commercial stuff. The the point is, I made about HashiCorp Vault. Yeah. Clearly there too. You can deploy Vault in in my opinion a far more useful manner when you've got an, a layer of storage underneath it that is also open source, you didn't have to pay any licensing fees for, that you can guarantee is backed up using S3 operations and is replicated across data centers without paying a, a single dime. But many, many times businesses make the mistake of assuming that even if it's open source, I still need to go buy the commercial version because it, I'm just not in my comfort zone if I don't do that. I, I need a neck to choke, right? Or whatever the, the terminology of the day. Get that. Come on, people. We gotta get better than that. But sometimes that's a difficult. You gotta pull them kicking and screaming into the latest century. So, but yeah. Liability thing. They won't be able to point fingers and say they failed. I didn't fail. That's right. That's right. I quit my job. And and that's a whole other topic too. Like, no, I think I'm actually running out of time. So I'm going to disconnect. The big rock.